the Southern Research Station. Welcome. Right, so they put the southern guy last, and uh, we all know how fast they talk, right? So here we go. Um, okay, so, so the topic we had, the title we started out with, the mapping tools for understanding disturbance. And one of the first things that I saw when I started looking at it, well, I got the title wrong. I need to adjust some things, and we don't have time to talk all about mapping, and some of the things that I talk about are sort of outside the bounds of disturbance. So let's change the title a little bit and talk about remote sensing for understanding vegetation change, which is more specific to the kind of things that we're going to do. Uh, and I'm going to blow through this quickly, obviously. Um, why care about vegetation dynamics anyway? Well, as we all sort of, I think, appreciate vegetation is sort of a natural indicator of environmental change. And some of the responses that we can see in vegetation are fairly rapid and dramatic. If we observe vegetation carefully, then we can improve our understanding about what's going on. We can influence the management of the policy. We can ensure some accountability. Are we achieving what we want on the landscape? All remote sensing has the, the potential to sort of help us or to contribute to all of the things above. And so, what I'm going to briefly do is just sort of touch on a couple of the, the more common remote sensing. Uh, tools that are available to you. They are by no means sort of the full range of things that are available. If you've been sitting in some of the talks or some other things that are, that are already out there that people are talking about, but I just want to sort of set the stage for some of that. Some basic principles um, will be familiar to a lot of you, but just it's kind of worth kind of reminding ourselves of some of this. Uh, we start off with some kind of sensor, uh, you know, a camera. Uh, we can mount it on the satellite, an air, uh, aircraft, uh, drone, uh, walk around it with our hands. We can do all sorts of various things. Most of what I'm going to talk about are satellite-based sensors. Um, all of these things sort of have the, the property of essentially flying over and capturing an image. Uh, they capture that in multiple bandwidths. We'll see why that's important in a minute. Um, once you've got that image, if you're going to make use of it, you've got to georectify it. You've got to line it up with some place on the ground, make sure the image is what you're looking at. And then you can start beginning with the image analysis itself. And there's often filtering. We've got to get clouds out of the picture. We've got some shadows. We've got some other things we've got to deal with. There's some compositing going on. Maybe there's, you know, there's edges in the images, all sorts of stuff. There's differencing if we want to look at that difference between an image on one day and another. And then finally, after you go through all of that, then you can begin to sort of synthesize what you're looking at and interpreting the changes that are going on. Now the nice part is, is that the folks who have, have essentially been developing satellite-based imagery for us take care of just about everything down to the synthesis and interpretation. So you can, you can literally go online, pull things off the shelf that have essentially had a lot of the work done for you. And that's what one of the things I want to hint on is that well, what, what do you do with these things that are sort of readily available as opposed to, to the more, more say, um, site-specific, high-resolution, you know, drone-based, satellite-based stuff where you might have to do a lot of that stuff yourself and you'll find yourself spending a whole lot of time and energy just getting the imagery cleaned up if you do that. Um, three sort of platforms that I would just want to touch on, and again, this is probably just sort of spans sort of the range of what's available. We'll start off with MODIS, the Modern Resolution Imaging Spectro Spectroradiometer. Um, this is, a, is a, a sensor platform, if you will, that's mounted on two different satellites. Those two satellites are going about in polar orbits. They're, they're, um, each one of them is, is literally passing over the same spot every day for the most part. So you get two images a day coming out of this satellite system. Um, they're, um, uh, they have different resolutions from 250, 500, 1 kilometer. And, and, they, they maintain different wavelengths or capture different wavelengths at those different resolutions. Fortunately for us, a lot of the things, the things that were most important about with vegetation, uh, they are actually captured at the highest resolution. So 250 meter resolution is what we're usually looking at. The most common and the, the oldest and most familiar and bestest and whatever terms you want to use is probably Landsat. It's been around since 1972 in terms of being um, up up there, there's been a series of satellites, a series of different sort of measurements that have been taken. They've done a great job of cleaning up the data, making it publicly available, going back to 1982. A lot of these things are consistent. It's, it's a 30 meter resolution. We've seen some other folks talking about the basis of that. 
um, 8 to 16 day return interval. The reason it varies is because one of the satellites got a bug in it now and it sort of sweeps across in a zigzag pattern and so sometimes you get 8 days and sometimes you get 16 kind of thing. So it's complicated but again the folks have cleaned a lot of that up. Thousands of applications, many of them are friendly, these sorts of things. I don't want to say anything else about Landsat primarily because it is so common and, and folks have, have seen so much of it. One of the more recent things that's come up is something that the European Space Agency is, is putting out there. This is the Sentinel uh, family of satellites. There's uh, something called Sentinel-2 that focuses on land and coastal monitoring. It's relatively new, only launched in 2015 and 2017. Um, it gets global coverage every five days. Same kind of things. We're trying to pass through, keeping the, you know, the satellite sort of getting a good sun image every day. 13 spectral bands, 10 and 20 meter resolution. So we're beginning to get sort of narrowed down, again, with these sort of widely available satellites and this higher resolution stuff. So when you think about some of the trade-offs, just those three, and you could put, you know, scatter all the rest of the satellites and other things in that same sort of graphic, one of the, the, the sort of inherent trade-offs we didn't have then is this idea between image resolution, that is the smallest pixel size we're looking at, and how frequently does the satellite go over. And you can imagine why this is true, is that, is that the, 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 the higher the resolution of the image, the sort of the narrower the sort of the swath as it goes across the country, or across the world. And so it can only sort of go around so fast and take so much imagery and, and get that down loaded, blah, 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 blah. And so we have these sort of inherent trade-offs. And so Landsat, oops, um, boy, let's see this one. Yeah, so Landsat, again, going back to 1982, so we've got a long history with it, 30 meter resolution, eight day sort of visitation. We, if you want higher resolution, you can go to Sentinel, you can drop down to about 10 meters resolution, but it's, 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 and, and it's there about every five, five days, so there's certainly some been improvements made in that. The disadvantage is it only goes back to 2015, so if you're trying to get a historical record, you're going to have a, you're not going to be able to do that with Sentinel. MODIS is one of those that, that we use a lot in, in the kind of products that we generate and the work that we do. And one of the reasons we like it so much is this uh, temporal frequency. The ability, you're essentially getting two images a day from this thing. And so you can, you can filter out a lot of the clouds. You can find a, a sort of a clear sky view of your landscape during any period. And so we can use that to develop essentially a near time monitoring system looking for changes. And we can, as you see in a mirror, we can see some other kinds of things pick up by using the temporal frequency of, of the of view. Um, just to sort of see what this looks at, um, uh, this is something Steve Norman kind of pulled together. It's a, it's a nice shot. It's, it's from the, uh, the northeast, uh, northeast Georgia. Um, and so what we've, what we've got here is, is this is um, these smaller pixels is the Sentinel tube. So there's your 10 meter resolution. So you can see, depending on your forest type, whether you're looking at a, at a plantation pines or in some sort of deciduous forest, you're almost getting down to the point of, of you know, almost single or a couple of trees in, in that individual pixel level. When you go up to the Landsat scene, you're beginning to sort of mix the type of signals that you see. The MODIS image is actually about four times this whole thing. So you definitely are sort of mixing uh, pixel types and vegetation in there just to give you sort of a visual of what, what the, uh, the imagery looks like. Um, one of the things that we talked about was bandwidth. Because these satellites have different bands, you wonder, so well, maybe I need, do I need all 30? Well, here's the nice part about vegetation. You can get most of what we're looking for in two bands. And the reason we can do that is, is because of sort of the, the spectral images and what plants use. And so plants use red a lot, um, absorb a lot of red light, they also absorb some blues and greens, and they emit light in, in the near infrared. And so some smart people have figured out that just by using those two bands and calculating this, this sort of um, you know, analytical ratio of that, they can get a pretty good indicator of how much photosynthetic activity is taking place in the landscape. And so if you hear this thing called the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, just recognize that's just using two bands of information. 
The nice part about that is those two bands are on all of the satellites that we talk about. So we can often find DBI data, we can compare it across satellites, we can compare it across systems, we can do lots of things with that, and you feel like you're in a pretty good company with what you're doing. All right, so back to this idea of using NDVI and now uh, looking at the temporal frequency that we could get out of the MODIS satellite. One of the things we're really interested in is the idea of phonology, which is just basically the, the temporal pattern of greenness through time. And so you can see that in deciduous forest, it tracks it pretty well. You start off, it's low in the winter, increases through the spring, steady through the summer, drops off in the fall again. Well. We're going to use that to not only characterize the vegetation that we're looking at, but we'll also look for changes in that vegetation. As we see changes in the, in the phenology, we will equate that with changes in vegetation. This is just to give you, I want to begin to sort of touch on all the, all the sort of magic that goes behind generating this particular plot, but this is just looking at, at one way of displaying all of the differences in phenology that we can capture looking across the cones. And so every Every sort of color uh, combination you're seeing up there is basically sort of has different attributes associated with phonology of, of that landscape. Um, when you track phonology through time, uh, just sort of quickly, we have the ability to, in the winter, sometimes see dips that we can uh, understand that are going on called snowpack. In the spring, we might see some sort of defoliation event come along, something that drops the leaf. Uh, leaves for a while and uh, it'll come back up. We've seen this in sort of late spring, uh, late frost in the spring and that. Uh, more severe disturbances, things that sort of, you know, hit in the growing season and, and sort of drop the, the overall uh, NDVI values uh, throughout and then some recovery through time. These are the kind of big signals that we can see and we can pick up fairly quickly and usually, you know, point those things to fire and other sorts of disturbances. Okay, well, so what, what does it look like when we start looking at this? So here's, a, here's something that you're, many of you I'm sure are familiar with, the hemlock woolly of the algae. Because hemlocks are in, a, in mixed forest types, they're, they're, in, they're affecting the hemlocks and not the, the, uh, the uh, deciduous trees that are in there. We can sort of look at the differences in the NDVI signal in the winter as compared to the summer. And we've, we've gone through and then across the uh, sort of the eastern U.S. found places where we see this distinctive pattern where there's been a drop in the NDVI in the winter. Uh, this is going back from 2000 to 2013. There is that deciduous hump going on every summer. The, the, the deciduous trees continue to, to be productive in the, in the summer, but the, the evergreen component is declining in the winter. So we can pick this up and we can interpret what it is we're seeing. Um, more dramatic sort of changes. Here's a Another northeast example, uh, northeast Minnesota in this case, um, where we're going to, to see the, the Pagami fire, the Pagami Creek fire in 2011. It's pretty, it was pretty easy to pick up in September. You could look at the NDVI values and compare that to the NDVI values from the year before and see the outline of that fire. Um, we know from the, the daily fire progression maps that you know exactly what was going on during the time period when the fire was burning back in August. This signal was showing up very clearly here. We also could sort of go in and say, well, what about some of the conditions that contributed to that fire? Well, we can look at in the larger landscape and see all of this other area where essentially where the dryness, there was sort of a drought going on. There had been a drop in greenness that sort of helped explain the, the preconditions for that, uh, for that fire. Um, we can go into some of the other tools that we have. This is from a screenshot from something called LANDAT, our landscape dynamic analysis tool, um, where we can, we can find the fire, find the outline of the fire easily enough, and we can actually then drop little points in and get a, get a um, um, time series graph of what's going on. So here was the, the pr prior years, there's the event of the fire, and see, you see what happened with it. It did have that dramatic drop. It clearly took out the evergreen component. A lot of the deciduous shrubs and other things came back, weren't necessarily killed in that, so you're still seeing spikes and greenness. But you can see the signal post-fire is very different from the signal pre-fire. And we can actually track this through time and begin to see at what point that begins to, to return to, to pre-fire conditions. 
Okay, um, I wanted to, to, so moving on to sort of other sorts of satellites, I want to jump down to Sentinel now. This is something that Steve Norman was showing you some graphics from yesterday, just as a, as a point of comparison. Here's the, the chimney tops fire that we heard so much about yesterday. From MODIS imagery, the kind of, of impact of the magnitude of the, of the fire and, and how different, you know, how much it affected vegetation within the parameter as, my, as measured at these 250 meter pixel resolution. This is a sort of the same imagery, but now a 10 meter resolution. So we can see very, very more clearly, you know, exactly where the fires were most intense, where the vegetation was was most directly affected, how the how the topography affected the severity of the fire. So, so we want to try to really understand the processes. This high intense or high resolution imagery has a, has a lot of advantages. Um, another fire in the Southern Appalachians, a Camp Branch fire. We have just an aerial view of that. Again, showing you that, oops, showing you that, that post fire, so this burned in the fall of 2016 and July of 2017, there's still already a lot of vegetation that's sort of come back within the perimeter of the fire. It didn't kill these trees, right? It just sort of burned the uh, fuels, but it did create mortality in some places. So Steve has analyzed that, again, using the Sentinel data, and he's got two kinds of sort of images. One, in a growing season, so those bare spots in the in the photograph are showing up as places where sort of all of the vegetation was killed. We're interested, well, what about some of the understory in that? So it goes back and looks at some of the winter imagery, and here now we can compare it because a lot of the understory here is, is um, uh, rhododendron and mountain laurel and those sorts of things. And so we can actually pick it up and sort of leaf off uh, terms and see the, the mortality effects on that understory vegetation. Okay. Uh, so in summary, the uh, lots of stuff out there. It's available for you publicly and freely available. <laughs> Finding the best choices involves asking the right question. Um, you know, there is no single sort of uh, platform or, or product that's going to be best for you unless you sit down and sort of talk about well, what is it you're trying to understand. Do you need, need to need frequent revisiting, you know, a one-off kind of thing, that sort of stuff. A lot of things can go into that. Oftentimes, the optimal solution might require using a combination of platforms and products. And that's why, you know, sort of showing this comparison between MODIS and what we pick up from that and what we can find by diving into it with the Sentinel stuff. Um, finally, just uh, <coughs> you know, sort of an advertisement for you. These are a couple of the products that we have on our websites, the Forewarn and the Land App. Um, my, my colleagues that really do all the, all the real work with this, if you want to contact them. And, and just let you know, we're here to help. You know, you've already paid for us. I didn't really talk about the unit that I'm for, but to the extent that you can um, have, a, have a use for this kind of information, uh, want to use it, want some help, Getting a lot of our stuff is online. You can just zoom right in. You can look at it. If you need help interpreting it, just give us a ring. Done. <laughs>